Welcome to Building My Legacy Podcast. This podcast is designed for leaders and entrepreneurs who want to leave a legacy and will provide strategies that focus upon key elements for legacy creation, determining your desired impact and its benefit, increasing your legacy's reach by engaging key stakeholders, planning, prioritizing, and executing. Here's your host, Dr. Lois Sonstegard. Welcome, everybody, to Building My Legacy podcast. Today, I have with me Jared Curry. Jared Curry is fascinating. I don't know how many of you at the age of 18 had a vision as to what it was that you were going to do and the business you were going to create, first of all, and then go for it. Jared did that. And so I think um, what an amazing story you have. And I'm going to have you share that in a little bit. But what he talks about, he is founder and CEO of Scope 16 Marketing, and it's a digital marketing company. And um, for those of you who are thinking about building a legacy and are wanting to organize that and really look at how do I have major reach with the and have the impact that I want, digital marketing is critical. So with that, Jared, let's get started with your story and how you got into digital marketing is this you're self-taught and yet there's so many moving pieces. So please share your story. Of course. And I just want to start off by saying thank you so much, Lois, for having me on. So excited to share my story um, with your listeners, right? And I'm sure everyone out there who's listening right now is really interested to know kind of how I got started. So, um, you know, it's quite a funny story, right? Uh, I was, I believe it was my junior year of high school, and uh, one of my friends came up to me and said, Jerry, well, you need to watch this webinar. And it was a webinar from this person named Billy Wilson, um, who basically taught other young individuals how to start their own marketing agency. And since then, Billy's become an amazing friend of mine, uh, coach and mentor, and we're helping each other out right now uh, constantly on growing both our marketing agencies. And um, it, it's funny because it was this, it was the year, um, it was the school year, uh, the beginning of the school year, I would say about September. And previously before that, I just had finished reading the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, my favorite author of all time, Lois. And for all of you out there listening, I'm sure uh, you've read the book. And if you haven't, definitely check it out. But I just had finished reading the book and I knew that entrepreneurship was for me. And I knew I just had to continue to build up uh, not only my wealth, but start to create my legacy. And I figured that once I watched that webinar from Billy Wilson, I knew I had to purchase his course, which was $700. And at the time I was barely, I was, I just had turned 17 and I was like, Oh my God, that's a lot of money. Right now it's, I look back at it. I'm like, this is the best investment I've ever made. It was, <laughs> and um, you know, it was a lot of money for me back then. And then I had to borrow it from my parents, but it's uh, it's been extremely worth it. So, okay. So you learned on the webinar, what were the, what were the things that were covered that allowed you to really get a handle on it? Because I think many people who look at digital marketing get overwhelmed with all of the parts. There's so many moving pieces. And there's a lot of big buckets, too, that everything fits into. So I get the, the webinar, but there's more than that that got you really with both feet wet and so that you could stand on firm ground. Oh. A hundred percent. And uh, for everyone out there listening, you may be familiar with a story um, that Bill Gates likes to tell and Warren Buffett, they like to tell as well. And it was the story of Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and how they knew each other as kids. Not a lot of people know that. And when they were 10 years old, um, I think it was Warren's father or Bill's father, one or the other, uh, they sat both the kids down and they said, boys, and I'm paraphrasing by the way, but they said, boys, what is the number one most important thing you need to succeed. And they gave, and, and, and I think it was Bill's father gave them a piece of paper and they didn't bill it and, and Warren, they didn't look at each other, but they both wrote down the same thing. And that was focus. Oh, and it was so interesting. They said that was the number one uh, key to success. And keep in mind, they were like 10 years old. And that story was in the webinar. 
and as well as in the course. And once I heard that story, it blew my mind. If kids at the age of 10 who are both multi-billionaires right now can say at an early age that focus is the key to success, I knew that's what I needed to focus on. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, and you know, since then, I've just been focused on one thing, and that has been growing the agency. And because there's so many different moving parts of digital marketing, it's uh, taken a lot of work, but it's also taken a big team. I have a big team and with that comes a big payroll, but <laughs> I do have a big team and they are great. Team. I'm sorry? How big is your team? We have about 10 employees in total and eight of, eight of them are full-time. Wow. Wow. I'm impressed. I am very impressed. You also talk about a, a system that you have in place. It's called the Unique 8 Figure E-Commerce Black Hawk System. Can you share a little bit about what that is and how you employ it? (laughs) It's funny, Lois. Everyone asks me about the Blackhawk system, and I wish I could uh, tell you everything about it. But of course, there are some um, proprietary uh, pieces of information, but I will dive into a few key things, right? And um, the Blackhawk system is simple. Um, first it's about, you know, nurturing a cold audience, then about building ad copy that converts. And number three, it's about really ensuring that the media buying that you have in place, which of course is running the ads is, um, systemized and has a, has a really a lot of targeting and a lot of data and stuff like that. So I'm going to explain all of that because everyone listening out there is probably like, what is he talking about? Um, so I'm going to dive deeper into each. Okay, please do. Right. Um. A lot of agencies out there, I've noticed, they uh, they they use the same ad for every client. They copy and paste it over and over again. There's not it's not unique to the individual's business, and every business is unique, as you know, Lois. Um, and for the people who are listening, um, I'm sure a lot of you guys own your own business, and you understand that your business is unique. It's n- nothing like your competitors. You put your own blood, sweat, and tears into it. So we try to make sure we're conveying the same thing within our ads. So to first start off with, I'm going to talk about expert copywriting, right? So I have a great team of copywriters and I don't know a lot of agencies that really have a full-time copywriter. I think they a lot of agencies outsource it, but I made it a mission to make sure um, that I actually had a full-time copywriter because you know it was, I would say about eight months ago, we were writing our own copy. I was writing a lot of the copy for the agency. I didn't have a big team there. We were still growing, still trying to make it happen. And I noticed one big thing. The metric that a lot of people overlook is something called CTR. And that, of course, is click-through rate. And what that meant is that my copy wasn't up to par. And one of my clients wasn't getting the results I thought they should have got. Got it. They were getting good results, but I don't want to get good. I want to get great results. And because of that, I hired a copywriter full time from that very moment. And I said, this is never going to happen again. We're going to get exceptional results. And the way we accomplish that is by making sure that we had an expert copywriter in-house to make sure that the copy we were not we were creating wasn't a sentence. It was in-depth copy where we literally spent an entire day learning about the business and getting creative ideas where we can create and, 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 and write unique ad copy that was going to convert, right? Um, Tell me something before you go on, because I think this is huge. When you do a copy and you hired a copywriter, what kind of criteria did you use in selecting a copywriter? Yes, a great question. Um, so first things first, um, I didn't want someone who already was writing copy. And I know that sounds funny. It sounds crazy, but I didn't want anyone who wrote copy. Why? Because a lot of copywriters have a lot of bad, um, bad habits, right? So with that being said, I made sure I hired someone who never really wrote ad copy, but they were number one, good at selling. And number two, they enjoyed writing. So my copywriter wants to go into the movie production business, right? So he's going to write in deaf copy because he enjoys it. He wants to be a script writer one day. Um, and, you know, with that being said, I knew that he really did enjoy what he was doing and he wanted to learn because you can always teach them the persuasive techniques. That's easy. But no one, no one can really teach that love and passion for actually writing. Right. So I made sure he, uh, number one, uh, loved copy and writing copy. And 
uh, you know, for all roles in our organization, it's a three-step interview process. So it's um, pretty strict, um, but I won't kind of, I won't touch on that. It was more so making sure I hired someone that had a passion for what they were doing. Wow. Okay. So I am curious because many people who are listening are also hiring. So what's your three-step process? We're get, we've got a lot to talk about. I can just tell. <laughs> yes. So great question. Um, first things first, everyone goes through uh, a job description post. And we don't post our application on the top like a lot of other people do. We post it all the way in the bottom. I want to make sure that they read the application and I want to make sure that they, um, you know, understand all the criteria, all the bad things about the job, all the good things about the job. And then they have to go through the actual application process on the application. Um, this is typical for some organizations, I believe, is they have to attach a video um, saying a, a 60 second video saying why they should want the job or why they should be hired or considered for the job that automatically deters a lot of people you know um, especially since we're a digital company we need people to show their faces we need them to be able and comfortable doing that we're on zoom every day with our organization so by making sure they're submitting a video it's it's making sure that they're comfortable with that number one number two um, I don't really look at resumes in my opinion I don't look at resumes you know I, I didn't go to college you don't need a college degree to work at my company and my my team members, they're doing pretty well, um, salary wise, right? So they don't need a college degree. All I need to see is passion. I need to see commitment, and that's it, and a willingness to learn, right? Um, so once they go through the actual written application part, um, we put them through a pool, and we typically try to get at least twenty different applicants for the same position before we start our interview process to make sure that we have enough data kind of to look at. And then we have our first interview, which is done with my COO. His name's Luke Simmons. And he'll interview them just to make sure it's a culture fit. I don't care about skill set. I just want to make sure that the culture is strong. I value culture tremendously, especially since we're a digital company. We have to make sure we're preserving that culture um, and making sure that they adhere to our core values. We have something in our company called core values and our team reads it every day. And it's kind of like, our Bible, <laughs> I guess you can say. And um, that's kind of what the first interview is for. The second interview is more so for skill set. My COO is also doing that interview. And then the third interview, that's where I step in. And that's where I play quality control. I tell them right from the beginning, look, this is, I don't care what they said on the, fir- on, on the first two interviews, their job, the applicant's job is to impress me now. I am the final line of defense. And that is how I hire that's how we that's how we make sure that we are getting the best of the best because I've learned from the past you bring on the wrong people it doesn't it's not just a money problem but it's also a time problem training people takes a lot of time I don't want to mess up I want to make sure that we're getting the right people from the get go okay so we've diverged 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 a little bit and I want to come back we were talking about your black hawk system Yes. And copywriting number one and having the best copywriter, getting them trained and getting your ads to be unique and specific for each client. So what else is part of your black? Does it, is that what copywriting contains for you or are there other items relative to copywriting that we should talk about before That's we move on to other parts? Yeah, of course. That's the main part is uh, just make sure that we have a strong copywriting process uh, for all of our clients. And it's really unique, right? Um, actually, something that we do that I don't think other agencies do, we actually do something called an audience hypothesis session with the client, where we're trying to spend almost the entire day with them just to learn about their business. We're asking them questions, stuff like that. So that's just one other thing I wanted to add to copywriting. But, you know, to dive deeper into everything. Um, is an is- audience hypothesis? Yes, that's, we're literally asking questions. We're interviewing people who have bought from that specific company before. Uh, So we get all their, we try to get as many customers as we can. And our copywriters are actually interviewing them and asking them questions so we can get into the psyche and the mind of the actual buyer, right? Um, We're sending out surveys uh, to their email list to kind of learn more about the company and get more input from the other customers, right? Um, And we're typically asking the business owners a lot of questions. Um, it's a really long and drawn out process, but it uh, makes it all worth it when they see the copy at the end of the day. Um, 
because we're primarily working with e-com businesses, right? So return on ad spend is is important, right? Uh, for every dollar you get in, you should be able to expect three, four, five dollars back, and you should be able to track that. Um, the Blackhawk system kind of allows us to do that if we're doing it the right way, um, which is what we you know aim for. So just to dive into some other parts without getting too much into the weeds of everything, because um, yeah. I know your listeners want to learn more about the Blackhawk program, and that really is uh, nurturing cold traffic. It's, I'm sorry, repeat that, please. Nur- nurturing cold traffic, right? Wow. So okay. um, it, it's, it's funny. It's uh, something called upside that I learned a long time ago. Um, and it's a, mar- it's a marketing terminology. And, and essentially, everyone in the beginning is going to be unaware of your product. Yes. Um, most people are going to be unaware of your product. There's billions of people on Facebook and Instagram. It's, yeah. it's not everyone's going to know who you are but we can get them to know who you are and get them to understand you and understand your brand, right? So what we've tried to do on our end is making sure that for every person that comes into our funnel system, the first ad is not asking them to buy anything. We don't want people to buy on that first touch point. It takes about eight to 12 points of contact until someone actually purchases something. We just want to teach them about the brand. Maybe give them a testimonial video. Why did you start the brand? What is the mission statement? Uh, and that is the first ad. Then the second ad is more about the benefits of the product and why they need it. Keep in mind, we're not telling them to buy anything yet. We're sequencing the ads. So imagine you go on Facebook, you see one ad where you learn about the company. Then you see another ad, why you need the product. Then you see a third ad, how it's going to really benefit you. And then the fourth ad or the fifth ad, maybe we start to talk to them about possibly purchasing the product, but we're not getting them to purchase until far down the line. Why? Because we're decreasing our our cost per acquisition. We're increasing our return on ad spend because it's a warmer audience and we're actually building a brand. We're not trying to make a quick buck. And it's, it's funny, right? Um, it's like this story. People buy for one of three reasons, right? Lois, what type of, uh, what's a sneaker brand that comes into mind? Sneaker brand? <clears throat> Let's see. Everybody, Nike, right? Exactly. And I'm sure everyone listening out there, if you're listening right now, you probably thought of the same brand, Nike, Adidas, same companies, right? People buy for one of three reasons. Brand awareness, convenience, or direct marketing. Direct marketing, the old school way of doing things, billboards, TV commercials. A lot of my competitors do that in the agency game. They're trying to get people buy right away. It's, In my opinion, it's, in, it's ineffective from the data we've seen. It doesn't work as well as you know building a brand, but I'll dive into that deeper. Then there's convenience. Convenience is when I want Chinese food or sushi. I go down the street to Fujiyama Mama. There just so happens to be a sushi place. They never ran an advert to me, ever. But just because they were selling sushi and I was driving down the street, I got lucky. That's like gambling on your business. Not all customers are going to get lucky and see the product that they want right in front of them, right? It's like gambling on your business. I know for the people out there listening, you guys don't want to gamble on your business. But the third way, is brand awareness. It's why Nike came up in your head. It's why I brought my computer because it's an Apple. I know the brand, I understand the brand. And that is why people buy. People, Simon Sinek says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And if they understand, if they know the brand, they're gonna know your why. If they know your why, they're gonna know the brand. And that's what we're trying to do in the Blackhawk program, nurturing code traffic. So we create a brand, we build a brand and they understand the brand. Wow. Okay. So <clears throat> you're right. Copy becomes hugely important. So nurturing cold traffic, turning them into warm and then hot um, leads and contacts. Then from there, what do you do? Yes. And this is probably the most intricate part. And this is the actual media buying process itself. Right. Um, and this is something a lot of people neglect. But the most important role at our organization are the media buyers themselves. The reason why the media buyers are the ones who are getting all the ad copy from the copy team, they're putting it all together. So for everyone out there listening, if your marketing agency never talks about their media buyers, it makes me question who their media buyers are. Are they based in the Philippines or a part of India where they're not high, high quality or they're not trained media buyers? 
you know, where are they getting their media buyers from? Are they just copying and pasting ads? Because a media buyer should be able to think. They should be creative. And um, they should be able to know exactly what's going to happen because they read the entire white paper for the Facebook algorithm, for the Google ads algorithm. Your media buyers should know this information. So we put a lot of focus on our media buyers to make sure that the copy that we get from our copy team, to make sure all the data that we get is accurately put together into our ads so that when we create the ads, they actually work. A lot of people can create a Facebook ad, but can you do it the right way? Can you set it up the right way? Because I don't know for the visitors, if, I mean, for the people listening right now, I don't know how many ads you guys are running on, on Facebook, but most of our clients were, were probably running about 300 ads at one time on Facebook. That's not as simple as pressing a few buttons. It's, it's pretty in- intricate and we have to really know our stuff. And that's why you have to make sure you have amazing media buyers on your end. Um, and that's the Blackhawk program. There's a lot of other stuff that I wish I could tell you, uh, but if I did, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> so it might be a lot of people to kill then. Um, <laughs> so you don't use people that are outside of outsourced. They're all within your company in terms of ad buy, and but your employees are virtual. So where all are, are they located all over the United States or, okay. So, so we have team members in Canada, the U.S., um, the United Kingdom, and, and uh, other parts of, of Eastern Europe. Um, and that's where our core team lies. Um, everyone's vetted. Every, we make sure everyone's fully trained. Um, but we try, to, we try to keep it within those in, mainly uh, predominant English-speaking countries. Um, and we kind of go from there. Got it. Okay, so one of the things that you also talk about is how um, people don't leverage all of the resources that are available to them, especially in Facebook, like with Instagram stories. So talk a little bit about that, please, and where there are lost opportunities. Yes, that's a great question, Lois. So for everyone out there listening, there's a few things that you guys can do right now. Number one, make sure you have something called the Facebook pixel on your site. If you, Lois, have you ever been on a website? And I'm sure, I'm sure you have, where you go shopping. I don't know if you're a big shopper, but you, you go shopping and you don't actually buy, but then you start seeing ads pop up all over the internet. Yeah, the, sure. the reason why companies can do that, and, and you're probably like, wow, how do they know that? They're, they're spying on me. It's creepy, right? <laughs> but, but it works. It's called retargeting. And it's, a lot of, it's something that a lot of people are missing out on um, and where your biggest returns are going to be. And I want to create godlike omnipresence um, for your brand. So it becomes a hygiene standard when they go on your website that they will see your ads. If someone goes on my site, we follow them all over the internet, YouTube, Google, Facebook, Instagram, any app that they have, they're going to see one of my ads um, for, for my agency, right? Um, and the reason why we do that is because, like I said, people don't buy till that eight for 12 contact. So we have to constantly keep reminding them of the brand and we're trying to create brand awareness. Um, so we, you want to make sure you're retargeting. And for everyone out there listening, um, you're missing out on a huge opportunity. And that is not having a pixel on your website. And if you do have a pixel, you're not leveraging it. You're not sending people who go on your website ads. Even if, if they don't purchase, you need to send them ads. If they do purchase, still send them ads. You want to the brand. Yes. So th- that takes a process and the pixel helps you track and to follow, right? Mm-hmm. So what else, Jared, um, are things that people could immediately do to really be more savvy with e-commerce? Mm-hmm. And this is what any 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 business that you all may have, you guys don't, if, if it's not an e-com business, you can still implement the same exact strategies. And it's funny, Warren Buffett, um, he has his private Rolodex and it has the world leaders, uh, royals and major executives of massive companies in, in a file cabinet. But guess what? There is something in, in that Rolodex is worth a lot. It is, it's, you can't even put a price on it. It's just so valuable. But I'm going to tell you something that I want more than, than that Rolodex from Warren Buffett. I, I, want, uh, I want your email list. I want your data. A lot of people have an email list that's just sitting there. 
They're not doing anything with that email list. But what they can do, they can plug that into Facebook and they can run ads from their current customer's email list to people who are most similar to their ideal customer uh, via something called a lookalike audience. So they're running ads to their most uh, to their most ideal customer, someone who's um, who looks exactly similar to their current customer in terms of you know economic status, uh, ge- ge- geographical location, stuff like that, interests and stuff like that. Then you could do something called a custom audience, where we're sending all your current customers ads, getting them to purchase something else. So all of that data is just sitting there and no one's using it. Lois, it blows my mind when I get on the phone with brands every single day. I ask them how big their email list is. They tell me and, and I ask them, what are you doing with that email list? And they, they think they, they're doing some email marketing or using MailChimp, but they're not doing anything else with it. And there's just so much money on the table. It breaks my heart, actually. It, it, it is amazing what money does get left on the table, isn't it? So, Jared, our time is almost up. I love your passion. I love how you have to just go for it. Things that we haven't talked about that you really think are important for the audience to know. Yes. Um, I want to just tell a quick little story. At the, you know, from the age of since birth to, to until I was four, I wasn't able to speak. I had a speech impediment and any words that did come out of my mouth, no one could understand. It took a long time, a lot of progress, a lot of hard work. I still remember it. I had speech therapists and everyone. Um, and it was difficult. I knew there was something wrong with me. And even past the age of four, I knew that I couldn't articulate my sentences the way I could, right? Um, and it, it stuck with me. But what stuck with me the most is the resilience resilience and the passion to not give up. Persistence beats resistance. And I learned that every day, not only in business, but in life. And if you just keep going one more, take one more step, one more, a little bit more action, you will succeed for all your, everyone out there who's listening right now, don't give up. Just keep going. Eventually you're going, you're going to make it. I promise. Just don't give up. And you got it. We're here to build a legacy. What's going to happen in the next hundred years? We're not going to be here, but our legacies will. It's time to make a difference. It's time to make an impact. And life's too short to give up. And that's that's the one last thing I wanted to mention. It's a beautiful way to end, Jared. Thank you so much. Persistence is everything, isn't it? And not giving up. You give up and you have nothing. So, Jared, thank you so much for your wisdom and your time today. And then thank you all for listening to Building My Legacy podcast today as well. We will have information about Jared in the show notes. So if you want to get in contact with him, you will be able to get information about him in the show notes. And should you have any further questions, just contact us and we will be glad to pass the information on. Thanks so much. You've been listening to Building My Legacy podcast with Dr. Lois Sonstegard. To book your appointment with Dr. Sanstegard, visit www.buildtomorrow.com.